Hi, I'm Jim Davis. I was once a proud proponent of the government. It's not something I'm very proud of, but given the circumstances, I didn't really know any better either. It was what I was taught to promote. Since then, I have made a few changes in my life, in my thought processes, and what it is that I'm actually looking to do with my life. I've noticed that a lot of people are unhappy with government. They seem to like to complain about it, but not really do a whole lot about it because it seems as if there's nothing else can be done about it. Or it seems as if the government is just too strong and too powerful. Well, there's a problem with this thinking. <clears throat> it's not that the that the uh, solution is not actually available. There is a solution available. The problem is in actually understanding the foundation of why it is you don't like the government. It's not enough to say that the government is immoral and violates your consent. If you don't understand what government actually does to your consent beyond just violating it and why what it does is a violation of your consent, then it's not going to do much good in order, in order to uh, uh, push your cause, dismantle the system. You have to have something to replace it, not necessarily another government, but you do need to have another foundation. And that's important. If you don't have an understanding of the foundation of government and why it's immoral and corrupt and broken and works the way it does, then you're not going to be able to get away from it. You're going to constantly come back to it. This is why I have a problem with other liberty-minded individuals who see fit to tear down the foundations of government and not actually explain the processes of how those governments were actually built. And I don't mean just, again, returning back to the idea of consent, that governments violate the idea of consent. No, what I mean is, why do they violate consent? Where does consent come from? Where do your rights come from? Where does property ownership come from? Where do these things come from? This is what we don't understand collectively as a society, as a whole people. This is what we fail to understand. And this is why we constantly have a rotating pattern of government, a pendulum that swings back and forth from limited government to tyrannical government, and the people who get hit by this pendulum are the sacrifices made in order to recognize that big government is bad, but little government is not as bad. Why have those sacrifices? They're unnecessary. So I wrote a couple of books, Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. I don't attack the foundation of government. I simply explain what its foundation is about. What the noble intent of government's foundation is supposed to be. And I let the readers decide. I'm not interested in attacking things that, that, that people cling to. I don't want to attack them. It's difficult not to attack them. So I try to be very careful in explaining why I don't like government because I don't want people to feel attacked. Yet this is what happens. I like a lot of content, a lot of things that other people in the liberty movement have to say. Everybody from Rand Paul to Larkin Rose, Christopher Cantwell, Adam Kokesh, um, Josie Wales, I 
I think that's her name. Even libertarian girl Julie Borowski and Austin Peterson. Austin Peterson, or yeah, whatever his name is. I like a lot of the things that they have to say. Unfortunately, there's a type of inconsistency that stems from every single one of them. This inconsistency is always the same. I want to be up front with you and let you know that I have not listened to everything that these individuals have said, let alone everything that has ever been said or written by anybody who has talked about liberty and morality. Absolutely not. But based on what I have seen, every one of these people I have listed are individuals whom I have followed for at least a couple of months. And I have read their, their pieces and listened to what they had to say. Of all of these individuals that I have listed, the one that gets it the closest is Larkin Rose. But I have not read his book, or books if he has published more than one. I don't know. What I do know is that even he still takes the same course as the rest. Attack and dismantle government. Why? Because government is a violation of, non, of the non-aggression principle. So what? It doesn't matter if government is a violation of the non-aggression principle if you don't understand what the non-aggression principle is and where it comes from, how it's founded. Now, I've been told frequently that I need to read certain books by Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard and, and these individuals. One of them has laid out the foundation of the non-aggression principle. I have not read that. However, in my book, Morality Defined, I have actually laid a foundation for the non-aggression principle. Whether it's the same, I don't know. But I didn't have to read anything else in order to figure out what I have written in Morality Defined. So, unlike other liberty leaders, I haven't attacked, or I try not to attack, the foundation of government and its corruption. I simply just explain the noble intent of it and let the reader decide for him or herself what's correct and what's not. So, I build new foundations. I don't like to dismantle because, again, it comes across as people attacking or being attacked. It's not a bad thing to dismantle and reuse but it's difficult. Everybody has to do that in their own time, in their own mind, at their own pace. It's difficult to try to get somebody to understand what may have taken 10 years for somebody, like myself, to understand. I can't give a value menu of information and tailor it down to a handful of quick sentences or short, easy on the eyes paragraphs for the individual to understand and read and suddenly have that epiphany that took a decade or more for many of us. It's not possible. And that's why I wrote those books. It's also now why I have decided after a little bit of peer pressure to make this particular broadcast. Instead of trying to destroy foundations and pick at people, get them to understand the noble foundation of what it is they're trying to achieve with the foundation that they have. And so that's what I'm doing. My approach in this is going to be much, much slower than attack and dismantle. There's not going to be as much blowback in this as there would be if we were to just simply attack those individuals who are proponents of government. But in order to do this, it's important to understand liberty and morality. Now, I wrote Liberty Defined before I wrote Morality Defined, and Liberty Defined absolutely can stand on its own. 
it doesn't need the definition of morality in order to stand on its own. Because most of us understand the noble intent of morality. That which is to not hurt other people without just cause, without warrant. To hurt other people outside of the realm of your own self-defense. But that's where it gets a little dicey. It becomes a little difficult to understand, and there's a great deal of subjectiveness applied to it. Because people say if it's supposed to be about protecting and preserving life, then we need to do X, Y, and Z, and then they proceed to justify violating somebody's consent to being interacted with, and then the evolution of government just goes from there. Now, morality is a little different. It's not exactly what people think, and it's important to understand this. Morality is about recognizing the value you place on your life. Morality is then about recognizing the value others place on their lives. First, you recognize the value you place on your life, then you recognize the value you place on other people's, or the, the value other people place on their lives. Third, you present the fact that you recognize that value, that idea that other people value their own lives. You present that fact, that knowledge and awareness to them in that you wish to interact and or live peacefully with them so that they respect the value slash your right to life just as you are willing to respect slash their right to life. That right there is the foundation of the non-aggression principle. It seems so simple that it can't possibly be true. But when you take away everything else, that is what's left. Now you can take this and expand it. And when you expand it, as I have, it's become three parts. The non-aggression principle becomes the foundation of all that is moral and immoral. It is the amoral foundation of morality. If an interaction does not violate this, then it is, at the very least, amoral. If it violates this, foundation, then it is immoral. If it is moral, then here's where all the subjectiveness comes from. This is why people jump my bones about it all the time. This is why I get told, hey kid, you'll eventually figure it out and you'll understand. Even though I'm 35 years old at the time, I'm recording this, and most people telling me this are in their early 20s taking some college class reciting something that they had just read that is reminiscent of the scene in Good Will Hunting where Will proceeds to school this um, college student about what he just read and how that he's going to change his mind in the, in the very next semester and forget all about what he just spewed to impress some girl in a bar. <laughs> and I should add that I love that scene. That's, that's just great. Anyway... The amoral foundation is important to understand, because without that, you can't get the positive deeds that promote life. Those positive deeds are what make up morality. And it's important to understand this. It's so very important. A morality is the non-aggression principle. That's it. There's nothing to it. Morality can then be broken up into two parts. Ethics and morality. Ethics, if you were to draw a line, ten, a ten-point scale, zero to ten, zero being a morality, the non-aggression principle, everything positive on that side to ten is going to be ethics and morals. Ethics will be right about from whatever positive that you want to start with to about around five, plus five. Ethics are going to be your lesser things. The things that you do 
that um, promote a positive frame of mind in your interactions with other people, whether you wish to interact with them because you want to gain from them through trade or, or, or whatever, or just to be more than just amorally polite with them, where you want to actually say, hey, let me get the door for you. You're standing in line at the grocery store and you have you have um, a cart full of 200 items and there's somebody else who's got three items in front of them and all the lines are taken up. Hey, go right ahead, ma'am. Go ahead and get in front of me. There, you only have three items and I don't want to hold you up. That's, that, that's good ethics. Okay, it promotes a positive well-being um, frame of mind and improves people's day. It promotes goodwill towards your fellow men and women. That's what the ethics are all about. It's why you you don't use foul language that is often associated with vi- physical violence when approaching somebody else that you want to interact with. That's what ethics are all about. And then you want to get into the morals, the the the, the plus the positive side of morality, okay? The positive side of amorality. And that is about feeding the hungry, clothing the shell or feeding the hungry, clothing the the naked, and, and housing the the homeless. Okay? That that's what that's about. Going out there and you actually physically refining your time, intellect and labor to produce real wealth in order to improve to first maintain, if not and or improve the quality of somebody else's life. That goes beyond mere ethics. It goes beyond merely holding a door for a lady who's got a child in one arm and a handful of bag of groceries in, in her other arm trying to struggle to get up the stairs in her apartment building. That's just nice to the lady and, and showing her that, hey, you would like that same thing done to you in return if not just to be nice. See, it's not that difficult. Morality is actually really simple, and it is objective, not subjective. The Morality is objective because it has a clear goal, and that clear goal is the preservation of your life. You value your life. You want other people to respect the value you've placed on your life, so you have to concede. You have to do something in exchange. And what do you do in exchange? You let them know that you recognize that they also value their life and that you're willing to respect that until they don't respect your life. And if you or I or anyone else decides that we wish to violate somebody else's life, their ability to maintain and or improve the quality of their life outside of the realm of our own individual self-defense, then what happens is they are then justified in retaliating and escalating the conflict in order to get us to stop and, and this is important, and to reclaim the value that they think they have lost. And that's where it gets really, really tricky. That, right there, is the foundation of the justice system, of rule of law, and that's the noble intent, to be able to curb that, to be able to make sure that we don't overdo it and form vigilante posses and just go out and willy-nilly kill people. And it's very difficult Unfortunately, rule of law does something else, and it violates everybody who lives under the specific claim of jurisdiction by those justifying the use of violence and force against them to collect taxes so that they can pay for themselves to provide this rule of law so that the people who are just in their defenses don't overdo it when stealing, or I should say, not necessarily stealing, but when they are recouping and gaining compensation for their losses. 
That's important, and that ultimately is the noble foundation of government. In addition to protecting us from that which we fear others might do with their liberty or not do with their liberty. In other words, that which the monsters we fear others might become. But by supporting rule of law, we ultimately become the very monsters for those we fear who will become monsters to us. And that is dangerous. That's why government is a violation of the non-aggression principle. Why government is immoral. So, how does this tie into being the foundation of liberty? Well, the foundation of liberty is simply in your ability to refine your three natural resources in order to provide and satisfy your four basic necessities of life. Now, your four basic necessities of life are shelter, sustenance, security, and happiness. The first three, shelter, security, sustenance, those three have to come before the last one, happiness. Eh, without the first three, it doesn't matter how happy you are, you're going to die if the goal is to maintain your life. Well, you can't live off of happy heartbeats. It doesn't work that way. So the happiness is the last. But it doesn't matter the order in which the first three come in because it depends on the scenario and situation that you face at each waking moment of your life. An unconscious moment. But how do we obtain that which is necessary to satisfy those four things? We have to refine our three natural resources. And these three natural resources, again, are time, intellect, and labor, specifically in that order. We have time. We have intellect and we can think. Critical thinking skills, those are important. I harp on that a lot. Anybody who's gotten to know me in the last half decade or so understands that that is something that I harp on a lot. It's important. And then the third is labor. And this is just as important. It doesn't matter how you refine your intellect, time, and labor, so long as when you're refining it, it is not going to infringe upon somebody else's ability to do the same and to provide slash create the real wealth necessary in order to maintain and or improve that individual's quality of life. So, liberty is about the refinement of your three natural resources in order to satisfy the four basics of your life in order to maintain and or improve the quality of your life without having to infringe in any way outside of the realm of self-defense upon anybody else's right to do that. And that's important to recognize because when I say right and not rights, I mean only one right. And that is all anybody ever has. If you are of the mindset that you want your life, the value you've placed on your life, to be respected, then you must respect in whole, never up for question, to be decided upon in part, but always in whole. The same for everybody else, equally. Now, that right there, because you do that, that makes you a moral person. You believe in the concept of morals. Amoral, immoral, and moral. If you believe in that concept, and you obviously do if you have value on your life and you want it respected, it doesn't matter how much you want it respected, you have to respect everybody else's equally and fully 100% of the time outside of the realm of self-defense. Because if you don't, then that makes you a hypocrite and it makes you dangerous. And if you are willing to recognize your own hypocrisy and you continue to do that outside of the realm of your own self-defense, then that also might very well consider you to be e evil. And that's not going to keep you alive for very long. Eventually, somebody with a bigger stick is going to come along and hit you and 
then you will have no stick to hit anybody else with, let alone arms to swing that stick. So, But you have, because you believe in that, that grants you only one right, the right to life, only among other individuals who believe the same. But 99% of the people believe the same. They just justify in who they're going to apply consenting interactions with. That's the only thing. It's either you respect everybody equally and the same until they give you reason to not because they have violated you unjustly or you don't respect them at all. There is no compromise on that. There cannot be. The only compromise that there can be on is how to act morally in the positive sense in order to help other people in order to refine your time, intellect, and labor, in order to produce real wealth. And what that means is, if there's a guy sitting on the side of the road, dying, and he needs help in order to survive, do you have any obligation to actually help this fellow? No, you don't, unless, unless you have intentionally hurt him, or unintentionally hurt him, by being responsible for his current situation. Now, if you know you hurt him and you did it with intent, it doesn't matter whether you have an obligation or not. You're the bad guy here and if you want to make amends, then you probably need to pledge a life debt to this individual and then after helping him out and repairing him and helping getting him fixed up and right and back to normal, in which case about the only thing you can do is pledge a life debt to him and hope like hell he doesn't hurt you in return. But if you didn't do anything to hurt him, or let me backtrack there, if you did something to hurt him and it wasn't intentional, do everything that you can to let him know and try to do your best to make amends and let him know and others privy to the situation that it was an accident, an absolute innocent accident. And then it's between you and the individual you hurt. But if you didn't do anything intentionally to hurt the fellow, and you refuse to you refuse to own up to your mistake, but other people there know that you caused the problem, then you're in violation and what you did is immoral if you refuse to acknowledge it. And they can come after you justly. But in order for them to come after you justly, there would have to be witnesses, and there would have to be people who agree, who understand and have recorded and documented this, and can help try to convince you otherwise to make amends. And this right here is the act, is the is the scenario, the solution, the problem. This is the predicament that those of us who understand the non-aggression principle are faced when dealing with dismantling this foundation, the system, the status quo, that is government. Because these people do not honestly understand that they are in violation of the non-aggression principle, let alone know what the non-aggression principle is at all. And that's difficult. It's, it's terrible. It's unfortunate that it has to be that way. So we keep taking shots and hits and, and, and losing people. And it's sad. It is so, so sad. But that's what happens. And all we can do is continue to share information like what I'm doing here and hoping that we can make a real change. Change ourselves, be the change that we want to see in the world, leave a better world for our children by leaving better children for the world, and so on and so forth. But there's another scenario to this accident on the side of the road. This other scenario is, you didn't do anything to this fellow. He was there by himself. He was on the side of the road, all by himself, got hurt, you came up. You have no obligation to help this fellow whatsoever. None. You don't have any obligation to help him because you weren't privy to this, you didn't partake in it, you weren't responsible for it, you didn't do anything to cause this guy's predicament. It is not immoral for you to walk away. This 
is where religion steps in and starts fear-mongering and creating nasty, nasty, just vehemently nasty things and thoughts in people's head, making them afraid for what? That they're going to burn in some unholy, ungod, just terrible existence for the rest of eternity because they didn't help some, help preserve somebody else's life that they were not responsible for? That's insane. And I, I, I truly mean that. That is insane. That, that is, And I'm not trying to mock people here, but that logically does not make sense whatsoever. If you don't hurt somebody, and it's not your intent to hurt somebody, and you are absolutely not responsible for it whatsoever because you didn't engage in any actions that led directly or even remotely indirectly to that individual's current predicament, you're not responsible for it. It doesn't matter. But if you are one of those people who sees what happens and you watch somebody else drive past that fellow, and then you chase that individual, and you try to pressure him and make him feel guilty for doing something, then you are almost, I would argue, half as guilty as the individual who intentionally may have done that to this fellow on the side of the road. You are trying to incite negative feelings, alter the perception, the mindset of the individual who was not responsible for this. You're trying to alter that individual, individual's mindset, the exact opposite of what I just explained ethics are supposed to be about, to a negative frame of mind. You're going to create blowback. Un unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. You're going to create blowback and cause a problem. This is what religion does. Of all the good things that religion is capable of doing, it's they're almost all based on fear. Creating or using fear to fight fear. Sometimes it's necessary to use fire to fight fire. Sometimes, sometimes there's just nothing that you can do, and you have to burn a little bit of the forest in order to create a pit to stop slow-moving flames so that they can die out, but it doesn't always work out that way. Using fear to fight fear almost is never necessary. It's, it, 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 it's just not. And depending on the type of fear, the type of fire that you might need to put out, you have to use different tactics. And this is the problem with both religion and government. Both of them use the exact same things. They both use fear in order to coerce specific behavior in order to seem as if they're an authority. And that's just totally nuts. How many people actually figure this out? How many people understand this? What that means? It means that all of our society is a lie. It means everything that we do and we say and we believe every time in the United States that little children put their hands over their hearts and they say the Pledge of Allegiance. Every time we say that Abraham Lincoln was a great and, and honest individual. Every time we say that George Washington, George Washington could not tell a lie. Every time that we say, oh, it's a Republican's fault, it's a Democrat's fault, it's a Libertarian's fault. Big L Libertarian, I should add. The party, the party Libertarians political party libertarians every time we do something like that every time we say oh in god we trust why is that being taken off our money we or that there should be a separation between the church and state religion and government it doesn't matter they're all one and the same anyway they're all based off of the same principle fighting fear with fear religious fear is you're going to go to hell or not go to heaven Government fear is that some other bully is going to come get you, so we have to bully you just a little bit in order to protect you from the other bullies. You don't pay the taxes, we're throwing you in jail. You don't abide by these rules, we're going to throw you in jail. If you decide to resist us throwing you in jail after resisting paying the additional extortion fees, then we're going to escalate the violence and then uh, possibly uh, choose to kill you. Which is also counterproductive to the whole perpetuation of government anyway. Because if you kill the citizens that you're supposed to uh, be, be using as, as uh, tax cows in order to perpetuate your own existence and to keep the government going, then you're eventually going to run out of them. 
And the same thing with, with fearing and scaring people in the church, in religion. It's, it's ridiculous, this strain of thought. And why people don't actually stand up for it, I don't understand. That's not true. I actually do understand that. It's for the same reason that my parents have pretty much stopped talking to me. So I can only assume and guess. Because I've decided to believe something differently than them. I, they were government employees for 30 years. And their entire existence is due to working hard. They never figured out what I have figured out. And if they did figure it out, they never said anything. And so they don't talk to me. Granted, part of that is my fault, and I don't talk to them, because every conversation we have pretty much turns into a political one, because somebody says something, and then it just goes downhill from there, and it's nasty and makes me feel bad, because I don't have like, the type of conversations with my parents, or the relationships, I should say, with my parents that I see other people seeming to have, but I don't know what their relationships are based off of either, so... But this is the problem that we have. We don't recognize this. We don't recognize the fear that is the foundation of all of these systems. Religion, government alike. And because we don't recognize that, we don't recognize that the problem is critical thinking. To be able to see that. If we were thinking critically, we would inevitably come to the conclusion that rather than fight fear with fear, we should fight fear with curiosity, inquisitiveness, ask questions, understand why are we afraid. When we do that, when we ask questions and we honestly seek answers, real answers, not appeals to authority, not logical fallacies, not collective approval, but when we actually look to see what the cause of the fear is, then we can fight that fear with logic and reason and facts and truth. When we do that, then we become secure. We learn how to use our minds and we create a sanctuary in our heads that doesn't require the approval of other individuals. We create a real sanctuary free of ridicule, free space, our only our private bastion of hope that's not dependent on somebody else's heroic and, and, and valorous acts, actions in order to come save us. We become the change that we want to see in the world. It's often a lonely path. It's been a lonely path for me to be able to do this. In part, it's been responsible for me being divorced. In part... It's been responsible for me feeling like I've been estranged from a sister. In part, it's been responsible for me feeling like I'm becoming more and more estranged from my parents. None of the people that I knew, the friends that I had 10 years ago, are my friends today. In fact, I rarely hang out with anybody to do anything with. And it's sad. I didn't want that. I wanted to be accepted. All of my life I wanted to be accepted. But I couldn't allow myself to fall into the trap of just letting things go. But I couldn't let I couldn't accept the position of walking alone and, and being alone in my life without understanding why. And that is the reason behind writing Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. I needed to be able to understand why I was walking alone. And now, quite honestly, if I were to disappear and, 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 or, or, or I was to be banished, I would be okay with it. I wouldn't like it, and, I'm, and I might actually kind of be driven nuts not having anybody to actually talk to, but it's not going to be that different from my daily life, from my, from my current routine. I very rarely talk to anybody. I talk to a, a handful of people a week, and I mean less than a dozen people a week with any regularity. I interact with people, but only to buy groceries, and it's simply just bare minimum ethical interactions 
where I'm polite to people. People do their jobs, I do mine, and that's it. But I don't actually have friends that I do things with. And, and that's changing, though. I'm meeting more liberty-minded individuals, some who follow me, others whom I follow, though they may not always know it, and people who just aren't following or trying to lead, but are just walking, and our paths are slowly going from being alone to being on the same path with different little bumps and rocks and streams that we cross over, but we do it with inside of one another. The more and the longer we walk on these paths by ourselves, the clearer we are able to see those walking paths that are close to ours and in the same direction. And the direction that we're walking in, we can see blue skies, green fields, beautiful clouds in the sky, and it's filled with new inspirations of hope and prosperity because we understand the foundation, even though some of us are not quite as capable of explaining it as I have here. New foundations of wealth and liberty. New horizons to expand our liberty into. And then that's where it comes into play. The whole concept of liberty defined. Essentially, we go out there and we just want to shrug off the foundations, the, the empire, the tyrannical empires that all governments become so that we can live freely amongst one another. We don't need a central bank to govern and regulate our money supply. We don't need an alphabet soup program to make sure the, the restaurants that we open and serve each other in are safe. We don't need any other alphabet soup programs to defend us and protect us and to extort us against other tyrannies that have their own versions of these programs. We know well how to take care of ourselves, and that is all we ask, and that is what I think most people want. Sadly, though, because people don't understand that base foundation, that amoral foundation, they don't recognize that people value their lives, want that respect, and are willing to do the same, to respect, to recognize that value in other people. Because they don't do this, morality becomes subjective and open for interpretation. Amorality doesn't exist, and liberty becomes subjective and open for interpretation, and then appeals to authority, having to look to somebody else to understand inherently and lay the decree of what is right and wrong, whether it be God or a legislature, an emperor or a king. They they don't know how they don't have this litmus test of what is of what is right versus wrong and why it is so. Again, it's okay to understand what is right versus wrong, but it's not okay to understand what is right versus wrong without understanding the litmus test behind it and why. If you don't understand the why behind it, what difference does it make in understanding why? Or understanding what is right versus wrong? It has been forever since I have actually talked about this this long without writing it out. Going close to an hour now, and if you have any questions about this, feel free to hit me up in the comment section below. Find me on facebook.com slash liberty defined. Add your questions there. Send me your questions. And let me know. But I certainly encourage you to read my books. They're free. Read them. They take each about an afternoon to read. You can get everything that you need to know in the first two or three chapters. 
Everything after that is just icing on the cake. I don't make you wait till the end of the book to get the full context. But certainly read the full book, both of them. Again, they're free. I'm not going to charge you for this. You shouldn't have to pay for something, at least that's my feeling on it, pay for something that you should already be able to figure out for yourself. If you are a proponent of government and you're listening to this, read it, take it. I'm not going to criticize you for believing what you believe because I believe the same thing. I don't have any derogatory names to call you. I don't have any, 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 I don't take any joy in poking fun at you. I was there. I understand the plight. I get it. I got the ridicule from it. I understand it just as well as as anybody at this point in the game. But I don't want anybody to feel as if they're being ridiculed. And in fact, I prefer those who support government and believe it's necessary, even just a little, as an enforcer of contracts, I prefer them to read, to read these books. Again, they're short, they're sweet, they're to the point. Well, they're short and to the point. Probably not sweet, but they're short and to the point to read them. Just read them. If you're already in the liberty movement and you want to understand what it is that that so many of these others aren't expressing or, or, or they are assuming that you already understand, go ahead and read them and hand them out. Print them. Give them away. That's fine. I'm okay with that. If you have appreciated the work that I've done there, and the work that I do on my website and the Liberty Defined blog that I maintain on Fakebook. Or, yeah, Fakebook's not going to like that. Facebook. Um, feel free to visit my website, www.jimlimberdavis.com, and donate. It's appreciated. If I can, if I can collect a fifteen to twenty dollars a month in donations alone, that will pay for my platform and and make it so that I can work less doing other things for other places and write more and record more of these. Anyway, like I said, it's coming up on an hour. This is the first one that I've done. And I thank you for sticking with me, if you have all the way. Again, please feel free. Leave comments, questions in the comment section below. Find me on facebook.com slash libertydefined. And check out my website, www.jimlimberdavis.com. And share it with your friends. Thank you very much.